Welcome to Roadcase, the podcast that explores the live music experience. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg, and I'll be taking you on a journey through in-depth interviews with performers and key people in the industry to explore the magic of live music, how it can be totally transformative for both fans and performers, and we'll look at how they take it all out on the road. It's going to be a great ride, so here we go. Hey everyone, welcome back to Roadcase. Thanks for joining me. I'm the host, Josh Rosenberg, and um, we got a lot of great episodes coming up, and this one's no exception. Um, again, I'd like to encourage everyone to get involved with the Roadcase community. You know I love email, so if you want to shoot me one and say hey and give me a suggestion for guests or just your thoughts, um, I'm at info at roadcasepod.com. Also, you can join the party over at Patreon. We have a Patreon site at patreon.com slash roadcasepod, and we'll have some exclusive content over there this month, um, which is really exciting. So you can also follow us on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And of course, we also have a YouTube channel at Roadcase Podcast. And of course, you can also, um, you can subscribe to Roadcase on your favorite listening platform. And when you're there, please do rate and review Roadcase Podcast because that helps out a lot. So thanks for all that and thanks for all your comments and uh, for joining the Roadcase community. This week, I'm really happy to have Dan Smalls with us of his promotion company, Dan Smalls Presents. Um, Dan's really instrumental in the independent venue world in uh, central New York. He runs the Ithaca State Theater and the Oma Gang Brewery venue, uh, several other outdoor venues and smaller venues in the central New York and uh, Western Mass area. Really interesting. Dan's been in this uh, in the music world for quite some time, um, dating all the way back to his days at Cornell. Um, he met Bill Graham and got involved with Bill Graham uh, East Productions or Bill Graham Presents East. Um, and he followed that up and uh, worked his way into a job uh, in that organization. And then before you know it, he's putting on shows in central New York. Um, Dan had a reputation for as Bill said, he's action Dan. He just knows how to get shit done. <laughs> and um, he has really been instrumental in the independent uh, venue world. And it's interesting to hear him talk about how um, he kind of developed and what his philosophy is. He is very band friendly and uh, bands know him for really coming to bat for them, um, creating a very home-like environment uh, where hospitality is something that Dan really takes seriously. He wants bands to feel at home and have a home away from home while they're on the road. And I think that's one of the more important kind of takeaways from what uh, Dan brings to the table as a promoter. Not only is he a great guy, um, but he also has these great relationships with bands who know him uh, really well, you know. Um, and he just says it's someone that just does what he believes in really wants to put on a great show. Uh, he believes in the live music experience and really uh, brings that to the people by creating also these special outdoor environments, uh, which I know from experience are really amazing places to see a show. And uh, his involvement with the Ithaca State Theater that he, he talks about is really interesting. So we also get some really great stories from uh, his experiences with bands and a couple of my favorite bands. He talks about the National, talks about the Avet Brothers um, coming to play at the Ithaca State Theater. Uh, so I really enjoyed this interview with Dan and hearing his perspective on live music. So the timing on this episode is that we recorded it uh, just shortly after the Save Our Stages Act was signed. So he'll give us uh, some insight into how this influx of funds into the live music industry is going to help independent venues. Um, clearly, that's going to be a positive, And um, we'll hear what Dan has to say about that and what the future of live music is going to look like from Dan's perspective. So... Thanks again to all of you for joining me on Roadcase for this episode. And thanks again to Dan Smalls for joining us on Roadcase. So here we go.
Okay, hey Dan, how are you? Good to see you, man. Yeah, you too. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming uh, coming on Roadcase. I really appreciate it. Uh, inside this, uh, again, this digital box that I'm sadly so familiar with these days. But hey, that's just that's just the <laughs> way it is. Like, I, you know, the upside is that I get to see inside everybody's off home offices and houses and closets sometimes. So, uh, that's like just everywhere. It's awesome. <laughs> we have competing amazing, uh, you know, framed posters behind us right now. So yeah, me and you, see. we've got good. Yeah, I'll have to do a screenshot at some point during this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is going on today with this is COVID, man. I mean, so I what are what kind of just to kick this off with some uplifting stuff? <laughs> no. well, I mean, not to joke around about it, but no, where are you? Uh, where are you with it with your with your venues and promoting? I mean, what do you what, what's your what are your thoughts? What are you seeing coming down? And um, do you have yeah. any any optimistic thoughts on that at all? Besides that, I, I do. I do. I think, you know, you know, John Sanders, my partner and I have spent the majority of this year without staff. You know, our staff is all going to come back as soon as we can have them. And I think this week, the signing of the bill that was unsigned and, you know, the last yeah. power play. Thank good. You know, that was a, a wonderful feeling when it passed. And then when he wasn't going to sign it, it was like a punch in the face. And then, you know, seeing that he did sign it. Great. You know, I think that means a lot to us in that we can bring our team back relatively soon once we get the grant through the Save Our Stages. Um, you know, I, I looked out for our staff from the beginning of this thing. I knew that laying them off meant they would actually probably make more money than working for us at the time. And we didn't know how long this was going to be. So but, you know, John and I have, have the, the good feeling that at some point this year, we're, we're working under the assumption that we'll be back masks off inside in the fall at some point. And yeah. we wouldn't be booking shows then if we didn't believe that because postponing and postponing again, it just, it's just not fun. You know, it's like yeah. we gave up on that. I think we made the smart choice though early on to say, okay, we're going to lose 2020 here. We're just going to lose the whole year. And how can we do what's best for our staff, for our team and our company mentality to survive it? We, you know, we, we might have been the first ones to start talking about drive-ins and pod shows. Maybe I'm exaggerating or patting us on the back too quickly, but we're in New York and Massachusetts, two of the worst early hit states. Yeah. And the governors were like, sorry, you know, your, your plan is awesome, but things are too screwed up here right now. And we're not going to let you guys do that. So when you're you know, saying your plan is awesome, let's back up just one half a step. So you floated the idea in general, as a promoter, that we're going to do some outside shows right now, yeah. early on in March and April, and then the governor was just like, "Well, well we were preparing for, yeah, we were preparing for summer because what else do we know? You know, I mean, so yeah. before I even saw the big article of the European, you know, drive-in shows, and we were talking about it, and we were ready, and we have a great staff. We have, you know, Beacon Skiff and Oma Gang, and places that we could do these things. We got a relationship with Bethel Woods. We had a million opportunities, and you know, we made the smart. I mean, look, we could have done a show March 11th, sold out with OAR at the State Theater because the mm -hmm. shutdown didn't happen till the 12th. But we're the type right. of guys I, that yeah. were like, let's we called OAR and the agent and the manager. And we're like, you know what? Let's just not do it. Let's just not, not be the people to get anybody sick because who knew? So we took that mentality from day one and we took it and we just accepted that the year was going to be off. And we like, how can we come back to doing this our way better down the road? And, you know, thank goodness we we run the company how we do. I built I started uh, Dan Smalls Presents, which is now DSP Shows in 2008. And John mm -hmm. Sanders became my partner in 2014. He's, you know, has a, an ownership yeah. interest in the company. And for uh -huh. all of these years, we continued to grow leaps and bounds. We did over 800 shows last year. We did a quarter million tickets wow. almost. And. And how many venues is that? Uh, I mean, exclusive, seven, eight, nine, something like that. But we work in all kinds of non-exclusive places from the Palace Theater to, you know, the, to, to Somerville and Boston to wherever, you know. So we're we're very much driven by relationships. But I don't I don't want to get too far ahead. But I think that what I'm what I'm getting at is that we went into this by not being people who take out from the business. We knew we were growing and I never wanted to live off of debt or the flow to future money. So I didn't take a dime out of the company as we grew for 10 years. So we went into COVID with a healthy, healthy bank account. And yeah. now the goal is how do we protect that to come out the other side? 
like so many of the people in the Independent Promoter Association and Neva lived off that Eventbrite money in advance. You know, like they were living off future ticket right. sales. I never would run yeah. my business that way. So we went into this. Thank goodness. We had just signed a, a deal. We got a great signing bonus. And, you know, we had a really good cash position going into it. So it has been just signed a deal. With we, well, we were Eventbrite hadn't decided to they didn't want to be in the business. They were very much into it last September when we agreed to re up. You know, so we and, and we had sold a ton of tickets from our first year. So we were a very hot commodity in the ticketing world last fall, you know, and sorry, what did the whole cancellation situation look for you when you had shows on the books then? Are you you're did you cancel them? Well, I mean, that it's a tricky question in that um, we had switched in our new deal to take money weekly, which we never used to do. So with all of our bigger summer shows that were on our label, we um, we had that money in our own account. So when Eventbrite decided that they didn't want to do upfront payments anymore, we were sitting on a couple million dollars in ticket sales. So if they decided to close, at least I had the money to refund people directly. And I felt much safer that way. So that helped a lot. And, and you know, as we, we've grown as a company, just having, you know, you could do three Bob Dylan shows in a week and write checks for a quarter million dollars. If you don't have that in the bank to cover it, you feel, because you're generally waiting for the venues to, to transfer you money for a few days or a few weeks. So I always wanted to be able mm -hmm. to be in a position to never have to rely on debt servicing, you know. So it was the same way with the ticketing yeah. agreements. Right. So you canceled some shows uh, and did you kick yeah. some down and then like cancel them later? And Every scenario yeah. you can possibly say has happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. All E. It's, the answer is E, mm -hmm. all of the above. <laughs> Always. Um, so you're, you're, you're optimistic about um, indoor shows in the fall, um, you know, and we'll get to this point and I want to talk about some of your um, other kind of outdoor venues because I think that's super interesting. But um, are you looking at those type of um, venue scenarios for the summer and kind of socially distant along the lines of what uh, the drive-in shows have looked like? Nothing's off the table, but if we are, feeling 100% that we're back inside in September, October, I'd tell you mm -hmm. I'm 50-50 on summer because why do, why take the risk? Why spend all that money, you know, mm. for basically break even or losing situations? I and mean, maybe, look, we all want to be working. Don't get me wrong. But my heart of hearts wants to right. do shows this summer. But I don't know if bands are going to want to come out knowing they could play inside for regular money in the fall and play for 30, 30% 30 right. well, money in the summer. You're assuming that it's regular money in the fall, meaning 100% capacity. I, I'm not quite so sure. I, what I do mean, you think? It all depends on what happens in the first three, four months of the year with vaccines. It really nice. does. You oh, know, and we're, yep. we're not getting yeah. the right information now from the current administration. I hope the next one will be more forthcoming. Right. I think they will. And I think that that will help mm -hmm. us tremendously to know where we stand by no March or April when it's time to really decide what's next. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a moving picture. That's interesting though. I, I find that um, intriguing that you would forestall coming out in the summer at partial capacity in favor of possibly bigger capacity in the fall. That's an interesting. Well, I think artists are going to be the ones who dictate it, not us because to play in summer, you have to be in a different partnership arrangement where X percent of the net goes to the act versus the promoter, knowing that in a 5,000 okay. cap venue, you can maybe do a thousand people, but the cost of the stage, you know, sure you'll get a discount because they're not doing anything, but the cost of production doesn't change much, you know? So the, the relationship, uh, you know, we build venues from nothing in all of our spots. We're not a amphitheater based company and, I'm okay with that because we create an experience that's you, one, you always know where you are. You know, like I, years ago I went on tour with a band in the summer and you wake up on the bus and you don't even know what city you're in. Cause it's just the same concrete loading <laughs> dock, you know, day to day to day. And all I, those sheds are the same. I, so, you know, Oma gang is its own experience. Beacon skiff is an amazing experience, you know, because we've created these spots where you have, you know, where you are, uh, and you know that you're going to be treated well, and there's more to the experience than just the show. So would it be kind of the thought that a band would be willing to do it for less 
up front or less money, for example, because they want to be in front of fans because they just want to do shows by summer. They're getting itchy to do totally. it. It's not going to be as profitable. I mean, isn't that the kind of scenario that was occurring back in the it, fall? It is, but example? they didn't know, like if, like I said, if we know. Oh, now. Yeah, right. Now we've got right. that on the horizon. So oh, well, fuck it. Why should we, why should we do this? Well, well, you never know. That could be just a band, band situation. Be. And speak, speaking of those, uh, in situ kind of uh, venues. I was supposed to come up to Ama Gang. I think uh, was the National playing there for the summer. Or is my memory just I just erased all shows that were that might have happened but didn't. Yeah, yeah. National was at Ama Gang. It was August first. Yeah. Uh, we've been working on that one for a bunch of years. You know, the National did a they did a uh, uh, warm up session years ago at the State Theater in Ithaca. This is a really great story. They spent four oh, days wow, okay. in a 1600 seater on a tiny stage compared to where they were going to do this year. Oh, I want to say it was, I think it was 2013, 12. Okay. I can look it up at some point, uh -huh. but it was around then. And it was the, I think it was the trouble will find me tour where they had that beautiful stage set. And I think they figured if they could pull it off at the state, they could pull it off anywhere. So anyway, long story short, um, Brandon, their manager now, was their sound guy, still is. He lives just across the border in Hamilton, and he loved hanging out in Ithaca for four days, and they rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed. And then the second to last, the night before the show that was going to kick off the tour was like the benefit sold out, obviously, in no time because it was a tiny venue. Mm -hmm. But I'm standing there, and I'm watching them rehearse, and I'm, our office is directly upstairs, and and – you know, you could just see that they were so ready to play, but they had to wait one more day for people. And I was standing there with Brandon and Tom and Tom's like, Smalls, let's get some people in here tonight. I'm like, dude, it's seven o'clock. He's like, we'll go at 830. Mm -hmm. Get me 100 people. And I said, you know what? It was the early, earliest <laughs> days of social media and I was no influencer, but I went out and found 100 people and they lined up and we brought them in the theater and they had this magnificent night of just watching this band pour it out to a hundred people. And I'm sitting in like the 15th row with nobody oh. behind me with Brent, with, you know, with Dawn, their manager at the time. And just like, this is so cool. You know, like we had such a great week and wow. it's it just, those are the kind of moments that nobody sees that a hundred people talk about for the rest of their life, you know? Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Wow. So the national are near and dear for sure. Yeah, to me too. Yeah, I saw a lot of their shows. Um, saw like the Beacon opening show for um, uh, I'm Easy to Find. That was great. Then just saw a bunch of their shows on the last tour. Went. So that was kind of like a preview, sadly, of partial capacity. Yes, shows. Wow. <laughs> 2021. Oh, that's a horrible thing to say, but I had to get that out of my head because it was like rattling but around. We, we still let them crowd the stage, which was which was. Legal the oh, time. there you go. Right, right, right. You didn't enforce that. The you didn't draw chalk circles around everybody. <laughs> oh my God! So I'd like to take it back to your humble beginnings because I'm so intrigued by the fact and by that you work for in, for Bill Graham Presents. I'd like to hear a little bit about that and how that influenced you. And then, um, you know, just briefly, I'm 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 interested in just how um, you started and. Uh, in the college um, show world and that amazing story about blues traveler and bringing them in. Well, that's and, where it started. Um, what, that was really the first of it. I came to Cornell in, in fall of 1988, um, mm -hmm. which if you do the math, I turned 50 this year and I still can't believe it, but it was the best year ever to turn 50 when no one could pay attention to it. You know, when you're not allowed to see anybody, but anyway, so <laughs> 1988, and I would never really been away. And I remember my parents dropping me off at, and I was nervous to be on my own for the first time, you know, at 18 years old. And I knew a, a senior was in this fraternity and I was first night. I just went out for a walk you know, looking around to try and find it. It turned out it was right across the street from my house. And when I was walking toward the front door, the next frat house up was Theta Del. And I heard this sound and I couldn't really place it. I mean, I grew up a music fan, but it was, it was Popper playing harmonica. You like, and, and he was same age as yeah, me, you know, like that was something you'd never thing. heard before. Like growing up with my dad playing, yeah. you know, Mississippi John Hurt and Howlin' Wolf. And, and, you know, and sure. I'd heard of harmonica before, but that was like, Right. Nothing so like that. instead of saying hello yeah. to Mush Bronstein from my hometown, I went to that <laughs> drug house. I went to the next one up and watched this show, and 
somehow we made friends, you know, over seeing them there that time or the next time. It's all a little blurry because right. I was, you know, going to college and. Um, it was but I think, party. yeah, long story short, I I did you got to know them and through them the rest of the New York scene. And a year or so later, um, Bill's son David had a company in New York City called Music Unlimited. Mm -hmm. uh, he shared space with Dave mm -hmm. Fry, who Dave Fry was BGP East. And you know, Dave now is lock in and you know, all that other stuff. So uh, I met Dave mm -hmm. and I, I, but, but I'd heard they were doing a series of shows with fish and blues traveler and a few other bands in the Catskills. And I grew up and, you know, eight miles from where Woodstock happened. And they were doing this set of shows, this, this okay. arrowhead ranch, like this hippie guy and his wife bought this ranch. It was a dude ranch. And somehow Bill had history up there. I knew the Bill Graham story from the Concord Hotel, which was in my you know hometown. He was a legend up there, you know, and the major D at the Concord right. who's in his book was my neighbor. The board. Yeah. Board yeah. Spell. And, you know, Bill was was running craps games and card games. That's how he made his living, you know, in the summer. Right. But, so anyway, right. I talk my way into a job. Then I find out it's BGP East, you know, Music Unlimited and um, I was a few years younger than the rest of these guys, and they were, you know, doing more drugs than I ever did. And when Bill came to visit, I seemed to I think the day he came to visit was the day the sheriff came after us because we didn't have a permit. And the sheriff was a guy named Joe Wasser and his daughter and my mother were best friends or good friends growing up. And he shows up and the sheriff himself is Rand and Raven. And I hadn't even met Bill yet. And I just knew I could go over there and calm him down. And I did. I'm like, Joe, it's me, Danny Smalls. How are you? And I think from that day on, Bill watched the fish shows, I think. or it was I don't remember if that was the weekend or not. But it was I got to know him a little bit and um, told him I didn't have a plan for after graduation two years later. I would love to come out west. And I think we had this unique little relationship. He took us all out to dinner at this place called the Dead End Cafe right along Route 17 back when there was a stoplight right. in the middle of Route 17 in Parksville. And, and during that dinner, he, he's like, come here, Cornell, come here. And he went, I'm like, me? And we went over to the bar and he's like, I think you're right. I, 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 you should come to come work for me. I'll find a place, you know, just stay in touch. Wow. 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 But the original connection was the whole it Sheriff with John Joe, thing. Joe Wasser. Yeah. Joe, yeah. Joe or whatever. But I mean, his, his son, yeah. David and, and yeah. Billy Cohen and Tom Gruber were really running the place. And they hired a guy named Chris Bowman, who was a tour manager for a while for the railroad earth. I think he's still in the biz down in Charlottesville. And he hired me and my nickname that summer, I'm almost embarrassed to say it. They, they called me action Dan. <laughs> well, cause when they needed something, I just knew how to get it done in the cat skills, you know? So what was Bill Graham like? He was, he was everything that you heard he was. He was larger than life, but he was, he was humble in ways. He was, I mean, the guy was a businessman. He knew how to get things done, but he had such a soft spot for that part of the world because when he came over on the boat and wound mm -hmm. up in Brooklyn, his summers were up there. He made his money up there. It was the place of peace and quiet. And it's where I think he learned to be a promoter. So he always had a soft spot and, and maybe I was, one of the many people I'm sure he wanted to give back to in his life, you know, and because I was from that area, I think it, I think it certainly helped my cause for sure. Plus, he got you a start in, in this business, pointed you in certain directions and you jumped because you were action Dan. What did you learn from him <laughs> about, about the business? Um, what were some of the, what were well, some to of the, he wasn't around a lot, but what I learned through the okay. company and through watching Dave work and all these other people was that mm -hmm. the artist and mm -hmm. the fan experience is tantamount. And, you know, I did a lot of history. I, I, I asked about Bill. I learned about Bill. You know, I knew the stories of the apples at the Fillmore's and, you know, there's just a lot to know about him and everybody who does this should know who he is and how he got started because it was always about that. And I right. think we've modeled DSP shows 100% on that model of, the artist experience and the fan experience have to be the most important part. You know, money will take care of itself if you take care of that. And the artists, the fans, the agents, you treat them right, you give them a better experience than anyone else, and your volume will grow, and that's how you'll be successful. And that's exactly how we went from 60 shows to 800 and whatever shows last year. Yeah, yeah, I love that about DSP and how you talked about that and really hits a chord. Um, not to mix metaphors, but I love, I, somehow, I always mistakenly do that. I don't know why. 
so give me an example of how that's really come home to roast for you with uh with your well, i think our company. first real you know larger scale partnership was when we became the exclusive partners at Oma Gang in 2012 and um simon thorpe was the president at the time and he just knew that having 5,000 mm -hmm. people in a, under the stars in a field in central New York was amazing for his brand. So he saw it from that perspective that the experience mm -hmm. would, would be this uh, intangible thing to what Oma Gang was at the time, which was this amazing upscale craft brewery. And right. my vision with him was let's let, you know, we're not going to get there overnight, but let's put on a diverse summer series that, you know, everybody feels like uh, they're in their own backyard watching this thing amongst the friends and family. There's never a fight. There's never a single issue. And the artist comes there and feels like it's an off day where at the end they play a show where they want to bring their family and whatever, whatever. And I think it ended, It, it, it yeah. that vision started in September, the last show we did in 2011 when we had the Abbott brothers uh, and Brandy Carlisle uh, and, and uh, Nicole Atkins, I think. And it was the rainiest, most miserable, night and everybody just had this magical time we had to pull 50 cars out with with you know <laughs> tractors and stuff at the end oh, and everybody no. stayed up all night and watched it happen and we knew that 2012 was going to be a a big thing and we had death cap for cutie and cake and alex crothers and i partnered wilco there and it was just a really great summer um lyle lovett was there I, I can't remember all the other shows i think we did we tried a country show with Darius Rucker, I think we did Bon Iver. It was a great summer. And and we learned that we can make wow. a better and unique experience than going to, you know, there's bands that you're going to see at SPAC and there's bands you're going to see at the Lakeshore and Syracuse, but we can make this boutique style, amazing experience, you know? So that's, that's where I think I channel Bill in a lot of ways that I want people to come there and just have a yeah. top shelf experience from day one. You're not buying a $14 Bud Light, you know, you're getting a $5 rare boss right, you know right. it's just and how, how was the avets show so you, how was that avet show instrumental and in kind of kicking that off because you still yeah you well with that, example. that was i mean they're they're family to me in a lot of ways i put on more shows with the avet brothers than almost anybody else you know they they were the type of band that when they started playing ithaca they couldn't tune their banjos you know they couldn't stay in and we put them on every like 12 to 18 months at the state theater from 300, 400 people all the way up to, you know, by 2012, when they wrote I in love and you, they didn't need to come back and play a 1600 seater, but they cared enough about me. They could sell out 1500 seaters in Ithaca before they could sell 700 seats in New York city. They found their growth through smaller towns and indie promoters, and they've been incredibly loyal. Right. So Oma gang was this, it was just such a special day. Like we were inside, we had, the ping pong tournaments and tents and their families came and my kid was there and watching Scott and Wiley, my boy play ping pong, you know, when he was, you know, tiny eight years ago, what was he four years old? I mean, it was just, it was a family moment. And I said, we can do this. They're going to tell other people about the experience they had here and the ping pong. Yeah. They're like, we'd love to play ping pong. I went to the neighbor's house and borrowed his ping pong table and we brought it over and they all day and yeah. like those are the things you just when they ask you find a way to do it the things that seem impossible you do and i swear to god the first show of the next season was cake and and john mccray said where's the ping pong table but the second part that john mccray asked for is i can't wait to have the muscles and the after show because it was mules frites the avids told people at other festivals that's how he knew about it so we created this this thing that was getting around and my vision was that in five or six years, bands will be coming to us wanting to play at Oma Gang. And, you know, that happened a few times. It happened with the National, finally. It happened with Jack White. You know, I went to Polestar in California yep. a few years ago, went to dinner with Lalo and Alex Crothers at, at John Paluska, the original Fish Manager's restaurant in Berkeley. And we talked that night about getting Jack to mm -hmm. Oma Gang. It took two years, three years, but we eventually did because we created this place that he loves baseball. He wants to go to the Hall of Fame and play pickup games, you know. We made that happen for him. So, yeah, I saw him at the Metro over the summer. Uh, when was that? Mm -hmm. Was that 2018, I want to say? And um, he, like, back on one of his amps, he had, like, a number three, a big metal number. I'm like, 
oh, well, you know, it's a metro. It's right across from Wrigley, right? So, yeah, he tells the story of how he, yeah, he went to the show. So I was there early at the venue. We saw him drive away, like drove down the street. They dropped him off at Wrigley, went to the game that day, right? Comes back with a number from the scoreboard and tells the story of how the, the Ricketts had him back into the scoreboard wow, area great. and he got to put up some numbers. I think they took some pictures and he ends up with the That's number good. back by when, his amp. When, at the when Jack, was pretty cool. yeah. Yeah, when he played Oma Gang, um, the, we were supposed to play on Double Day Field that day. And, and if we did, I was going to get the play. But it was so rainy in the morning that we had uh. to find him a Double Day wouldn't let us on the field because it would get destroyed. We found a, a backwoods high school six miles away, and, and they got to play down there instead. But he, he owns part of a bat company, and so the owners of the other owners were in town, and it was it was a super fun day. Yeah. Wow. So that, that's totally it, it cool. came about like that. Um, like we would, I mean, Juan Carrera who managed modest mouse and all those other, you know, and iron and wine over the years, you name mm -hmm. it, he's managed them. We were, we're great friends. And, um, at the time he's like, we're going to bring modest mouse there for a weekend and we're going to make it special. I'm like, okay, let's make it happen. And we put one on sale and he was living in LA at the time. And we went on sale and seven minutes later, we sold 5,000 tickets, which I couldn't um, wow. I think that was the one with brand new, so it was going to go quick. But I mean, Eventbrite or it was Ticketfly at the time yeah. called me like, "You're sold out." I'm like, "It's been seven minutes. No way. This has never happened before." I'm like, how many scalpers <laughs> are there? Like none. Ten oh seven. I'm on the phone with Juan. He's like, "Okay, let me call and get Frank Turner for the second day, and we'll back into it." And we were back on sale in an hour. But you know, so that was the vibe I wanted to create. So Oma Gang was a great example. They've they've gone through their struggles lately, trying to figure out who they are as a company. So. Who knows what the future holds, but uh -huh. it's a great example of how DSP became what DSP is. Yeah, and it's tied intrinsically with uh, the Ithaca State Theater, right? I mean, you're you're promoting there, but you have a special tie to that theater. And can you sure, talk about well, that's that? where it all started for me. Like when I came back here, um, I mean, I should almost go back further. When I left Boston, and, you know, right around the, the turn of the century there in in the millennium. Um, I can't went down and helped get Bethel Woods going in 2000 or 2001, I think, and took a couple of years away. It was right after the roll up and, and I wasn't sure what to do next. And when I moved to Ithaca to get married, I didn't know, you know, I had helped my dad sell his business before he got sick there. And I had a year off and I wasn't sure what to do. And I saw that the state theater was definitely struggling. They had brought in someone who was trying to be, I like to say he was trying to be the cultural hand of God. You know, he wanted to put on Broadway shows and, and you know highbrow music and stuff like that and Ithaca is not that kind of town it wasn't going to work and they were very close to closing and you know after the blues traveler thing at Cornell I wound up working for the haunt and John Peterson and I uh did shows at the state theater and back in the 90s I mean we did fish mm -hmm. there and the samples there and all kinds of bands and um you know it's a whole nother thing we can get into after but the story was the state theater was really close to closing and i think that's the impetus for really how dsp and dance Moms presents came to be a company and that i decided to work for the historic preservation company to save the building and in, in 2006 and i started to give ithaca what it okay. wanted i gave you know we did arlo guthrie and anthony lyle lovett and you know i i found that that community first who are going to be the ones who are of the right age to support the theater but at the same time i put stars and and you know mm -hmm. new pornographers and bands like that that got the kids down off the hill and um it started to become viable again and, and then and then there was the whole how do we stay a not-for-profit that running historic preservation versus this so we found a way to spin it off onto its own not-for-profit which allowed me to break away from it like we put someone in place to take care of the building and state theater of ithaca inc and then esp became the company that was going to buy the shows mm -hmm. and we came out of the box in 2008 you know, guns blazing with, uh, you know, five, six sellouts, John Prine and, and uh, three girls and their buddy with Emmy Lou Harris and Sean Colvin and Buddy Miller and, and, uh, and Patty Griffin. What a great show, uh, yeah. you know, and, and Joan Baez and George Thurgood. And it was just show after show after show. We're just doing amazing business. And we got very lucky as DSP and as the state because, right. you know, the ancillaries lived with them. I made a very anti-promoter deal in that I let them keep, you know, some of the ticketing money and, 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 you know, like, like their dollar a ticket was a really big deal to them, you know, cause I've never been one to put $7 surcharges on there. I'm not that, I just, 
if I can't make it the right way, I don't want to make it, you know? So we just did shows that did a lot of volume and sold a lot of tickets and we made money the, the right way without taking advantage of anybody. And I think that's how the state theater became solvent. It's how DSP got off to a great start. And, you know, a lot of people call me crazy for the way we've done it, but I just couldn't and be a guy who's putting a seven dollar surcharge on the ticket and, and like who I who I'd be theater where where tickets are 35 bucks I just I couldn't be that guy in those days you know so you created uh, DSP at the same time that you were running state theater and then just combined the two and hired the talents to come and play in that theater in a, in a way to both boost uh, DSP's beginnings as well as um, you know, increase kind of yeah, the fortune. I didn't uh, want to do both theater, jobs. I mean, I did that yeah. for a year and a half. I was trying to, you know, secure funding to fix the roof at the theater at the same time as talking to Frank Riley. You know, I just, you can't, it was too much for one person. So we formed a new board. I said, listen, you got to find the money to hire an executive director who can deal with, you know, SHPO, the state preservation organization and, and all that and the fundraising and the donations and sponsorships. So, and, and DSP didn't just book, we took all the risk on the high end talent and uh, the reward as well, but we were hired by them mm -hmm. to book a, a, you know, a series for the town as well. We booked a handful of family shows. We booked, you know, we, we'd give up a show every now and again that we might do ourselves that fit into the state series, like a, the Temptations or a Paula Poundstone or something like that, that fit their mission. So we got there right. and we knew we needed that venue as an anchor. And we did it by by sharing. There's a word you don't hear promoters say very often, but we shared the building. We didn't say give us yeah, half the beer, keep the beer. We'll do it in volume. And this is our hub and we'll grow from here. Right. Interesting. Um, before, I just wanted to take it back to what you talked about, Modest Mouse and the band managers. You mentioned, uh, you know, I heard you talk about um band having relationships with bands having relationships with managers and how that quote unquote that pisses agents off can you talk a little bit about that and how kind of your 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 personal relationships with band bands yeah. have have helped your promotion efforts totally i i think that in the olden days or years ago that was much more the case you know it's the the hands-on approach of management and agencies certainly I don't think it's frowned on as much as it used to be, but I don't think you were supposed to talk to managers back in the day as much as I did. Um, I don't really, I never really cared much about it because I never mm -hmm. was making deals without an agent involved. But if I was friends with Juan, you know, Juan would tell the agent, I'm sorry, Dan and I are friends, you know, and we're going to talk. And I think that helps. I, I think with, with certain, yeah. Yeah. like our, our vision was just to create, a relationship where we were all some sort of, you know, we were in it together. If we can't be partners with the acts and managers, then why do it? You know, it, it's not adversarial. And I worked for a lot of people who, where I learned lots of good things and lots of other, you know, lots of other ways to do it. And I was never going to nickel and dime to make a few extra bucks on this show uh, and forgo the future by doing that. I would much rather give a little bit more today to have a lot with an act. And I think we grew because of those relationships, because of having good relationships with managers, instead of getting a call that, hey, blah, blah, blah's coming to the Northeast, give me state theater avails. Mm -hmm. It's like, now the call is, hey, blah, blah, blah's coming to the Northeast between February and March. Where do you want to do it? You know, so that's the call in life when you can send an offer for Ithaca, Buffalo, and Syria, you know, and, right. and Albany, and Northampton, and you know, sure. wherever. So you put six out there, maybe you get the whole run, maybe you just get one. But, you know, we did a handful. La Montaigne dates that way. When Modest Mouse came to the Northeast in uh, right. fall of 2017 or 18, I think we did 45% of their shows. I think we did six shows that fall. In the wow. And that's not necessarily the case with other promoters? I, I think it is in other places. Sure. I mean, we're not unique in that regard, but I don't know. I've always tried to go above and beyond. You know, like I, I wouldn't call managers to have a better relationship with them. It'd be like, if, yeah. if a band was coming to town, I wanted to do something nice for them on a sold out show. I would call the manager and say, Hey, what are they into? I don't, I don't just have to look at the, the rider and say, okay, they want this, but they get that every day, usually less than, but we try to do more than. So 
um, you know, I'll call and say, what's the band into these days? Is it uh, stories about the Revolutionary War? Maybe I'd buy a book about that and leave it backstage. Or, you know, when Lyle Lovett came to the state, I had someone send Shinerbach from Texas before it was distributed in, in New York. And that was a little moment that meant something in 2008 to him, you know. So it's little things like that, I think, that cement your relationship right. as being a cut above. Yeah, yeah. But and that's got to pay benefits going forward. And and mm -hmm. with your your relationships with bands, why you clearly they're coming back to the theater because uh, because they love to and they have a good relationship. It's better than having a bad relationship when you're not going to see them anymore. Well, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I don't talk bad of other people in the industry, but there's a lot of ways to do it. And ours is is ours. And it seems to be working. And Thank goodness for that, because it's it's a it's a way of doing business that allows me to brush my teeth at night and look at the dude I see and be like, good for you, you know, good for you yeah. for doing it the way you're doing it. Yeah. And apart from personal relationships, I mean, today, independent venues are just really, really struggling, obviously. I mean, in ways that no one imagined a year ago. Um what kind of what what are your thoughts about independent venues? Are they going to be getting the funding that they need? What's what what are you sort of seeing? What's the big picture that you're seeing out there right now? Well, we're lucky in in many respects that a lot of our partnerships, the the venues are doing OK. I think Daryl's house is going to be OK. I know that Asbury Hall and Buffalo is doing OK. Um, State Theater is going to be fine. You know, the Academy of Music in Northampton is doing fine. There's a few. The Gateway City Arts has decided not to reopen in Holyoke. You will, we'll find another club in Northampton. We we now own the Haunt name and history. We knew for a while that the Haunt was losing its lease in September of 21. Is that that's the venue in that's Holyoke? That's the Ithaca Club. That's the four hundred oh, seater okay. in Ithaca, four hundred fifty seater. Um, so Holyoke was Gateway City Arts, and that's not going to reopen. But you know, there's other out mm -hmm. there for us in that level but so we bought the haunt we were in negotiations last fall and we didn't find the right deal and it was very tricky because we knew they were losing their lease but through the pandemic one of my biggest chores has been working with a food and beverage partner and a landlord to find a new location where we'll have a small amount of ownership and maybe it's called the haunt still maybe it isn't but we're working to create that first first class New York state upstate venue, which they're really, you know, there's some great venues out here, but we want one to be the primo one where you have to play where the, you know, the, and the, the state theater, the whole there. experience is better, you know? And so we're working on that. The state theater is not the state there? theater is, but that's a seated theater. This is our open floor club. That's what this is our open oh, floor. Okay. All right. You need both. I mean, the state okay. theater, is, you know, fixed theater seating. It's a proscenium stage. It's, it's a different animal, you know? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I hadn't been. So I, I didn't know that was the distinction that you're making. Yeah, for sure. You play the the haunt and then you play the state and then you move to the, the outdoor spot. So, you know, we found our own little network of real estate, which is what a good promoter has, you know, grows with the act. Yeah. 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 And different sort of differentiated to different levels. Yep. And had you ever thought about taking seats out of the the state theater or having removable part? Does it have, are there some removable in like the front? Like those are so, yeah. I mean, we can pull off GA shows there. We've done everything from glass animals to, you know, to hip hop in there and, and we pull it off, you know, so it's, it's fine. It's, yeah. uh, it's not ideal, but you know, Doug's working on that. That's his job. It's a really old building. Yeah. So it would cost a lot to sprinkler it properly for the removal of seats, which to me makes no sense. I think some of these municipal laws are ridiculous, but. So going, going forward also, you did some collaboration with noon chorus and um, I had entered Andrew Jensen on the, on the show. In fact, uh, um, his episodes airing the week that we're, you and I are recording this. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the streaming world from your perspective and how that's sort of changing how you're looking at live music? Well, I mean, look, we all wanted to stay busy through this. And I think that early on getting an act to send you a song for like a state theater benefit was really easy. We found that doing the one we did here, you know, right around Thanksgiving was really hard. I had to mortgage a lot of relationships at this point. Because bands are able to do the streaming on their own now. So we've done a ton of it. Um, we've had... What was it that what was it that made that much harder than I think before? early on no one knew how long this was gonna be. So so people were just home recording every night. It was really easy to say, Hey, Rhett Miller, send me a song or hey, 
Oh, right. Now there's just more com competition and uh, everyone's busier with doing, everyone's made the pivot and shifting and now we're kind of in the stream. Yeah, they are. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've done a bunch of these and I think we were very diligent. My partner was the, was amazing at this, like certain streams that we did, we, we would put up the Facebook event first, even almost before the act. We sold like 300 tickets to Nathaniel Rateliff all over the country because our Facebook event felt like the one that was first. We sold 300 tickets to a Mary Chapin Carpenter live stream, which was amazing. But then there's also been ones where we've sold, you know, eight tickets and made $16, you know, so it's really been here. Yeah. So what, what, was the, what was the key to the one where you were out first and why did it feel like you were out first or did you know you were out first? And was it just that all of a sudden you got all these ticket sales and you're like, I mean, we must have been I, out first. I mean, look, it, in the end, it still wasn't a major windfall by any stretch, you know, well, no, I'm just curious. Like, so you, uh, I, you know, I talked to Andrew and, um, you know, he's co-promoting with all these different promoters who have obviously different fan bases. I just was curious as to how that sh kind of shakes out. And I think that we um, were lucky in that it's just how the timing went more than anything else. I think, that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the at that time they hadn't changed some of the rules of how artists would, would, they would instantly be added to the event. They didn't have to sign off on it themselves first. So you would okay. make a thing for, you know, whoever it was, you know, uh, and, and they'd instantly be added as well. So it was instantly legit without waiting for the manager to click the button approving, you know, the event. So I think that's gotcha. a lot uh -huh. and we were just early to the game. But in the end, we're just trying to help our friends mostly. You know, we did, I don't know, we've probably done 50 of these. It's It's been, it's been helpful, but I mean, if it paid, payroll yeah. cycles for us that's about all we made yeah, absolutely but from your perspective as a promoter now i've heard a lot of bands and venues um and guys like andrew obviously at noon chorus they're seeing a future in streaming a future in being able to bring music to fans that for one reason or another may not attend a particular show or it could because that band's just not going to their town or they're super fans and want to see every single show is that going to cannibalize you at all? Um, and what's kind of your your view on bringing video equipment into a show where you want people to buy tickets? I don't think that, I think in the end, the live experience will come back strong. I think people like being around other people to see it. Look, I, I think offering it to more places at the same time is great for the act. You know, I don't, I, you know, I don't think it's going to affect us uh, in our specific venues. I don't. I know personally, I would rather be at the State Theater or the Haunt to see the show if I lived in Ithaca. So I don't think mm -hmm. it, it may yeah. affect some of those hour and a half to two hour away people. Maybe you know. Mm -hmm. I get it. Right. So it's kind of a radio, a little bit of a radius play, right? Maybe I, I think that would uh -huh. be important to not sell it to people who traditionally would drive to see it. But if you're in Colorado and want to see the National at the State Theater. Have at it, you know. It's not like you're gonna. Fly. Yeah, for sure. Okay, but, yeah, you know, that's interesting. I mean, if they're touring, they might not want to do as much of it. The, maybe it's for areas where they're not currently touring, where they can make a little extra change. You know, like if you're not playing Minneapolis on this run. It's interesting. Bands have got the technology. They've got the know-how now. They're kind of getting it down. It's like, are we going to be working with the venues going forward with, with live music? I mean, you know, they did it with drive-ins because it was partial, right? A lot of the jam bands, et cetera, and other bands were doing it at drive-ins because it was, you know, um, you know limited seating um, to make it available for everybody. And the, by, by the time they're making it available to those that couldn't go, they might as well make it available to those Anywhere. that, you know, to every to, to all their fans everywhere else they want to see it. I mean, I saw some of my favorite bands that were doing drive-in shows uh, more times this fall than I had ever seen them yeah. before. Well, uh, happened with couch tour has always been a thing with Fish. I think that, um, you know, we've definitely done some of those type of things with Nugs.net or, or whatever, or .fm or whatever they are. Um, yeah. Like when yeah. Dark Star Orchestra did their 2000 live show, it was at the State Theater. We did that one live when they did uh, – 5877 dead show cover at the state theater in Ithaca. We let that one was streamed. We did it with Mo. We did that where 5877 was recorded. Yeah. Wasn't that a, that was in Cornell at Cornell University? Well, that though, right? at Cornell yeah. when the dead play there, but when Dark Star did it at the state theater, we recorded that one and streamed it too. I think they made a DVD out of it also back in it was it was oh, no kidding, <laughs> 2007. I think we did it. 
Huh. Okay. So like that was like, I don't know, slow math. 30th. It was the 30th. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they, they even were just typical dark star. They did, they played dark star as the first song as a joke and then broke into the five, eight, 77 set list. So they were teasing people even. Yeah. I haven't seen them in a while, but I loved just when I, when they first came out, you know, being in Chicago, they played her a bunch and just the whole concept of coming out and starting to play it, you know, it's just so super dead yep. heady. And just try having to guess which show it was and them not telling you. And they would even, you know, to switch around the positions on the stage. Like, oh, no, this is a Jerry stage right era. Okay. Uh, that would narrow it down a, slightly. I always had a little hard time with that. You know, like, come on. You're, Did you? Why? But don't be so legit. You want to sell out the state theater, which you haven't done in the last couple of runs? Announce the show you're going to play. Do the other Cornell show, you know. Maybe that'll work. But Always thinking out of the box, Dan. That's kind of how we stay at the curve, I guess. It's not a bad thing. It's not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but one of your mantras was like, break the rules, do what you believe. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, there are certain unwritten rules of how you're supposed to do it. I think that that went to, you know, if I was friends with a manager, I'm not going to not talk to him. I'm not, I mean, what I'd rather, it's not ask for, it's not apologize later, you know, that, that mentality, but I know what I'm good at. I know what I offer. I know how, how our company can benefit other people. So, you know, yeah. Why live up to all those standards all of the time, you know? And in, in what way? So, yeah. And, and along those lines, like in what ways are you bumping up significantly with the big guys? The like, I always thought there'd be more of it, but there's a lot of room under that glass ceiling, you know, like they, they, my favorite line that I say all the time is that their stockholders are Wall Street. And I guess we now know Saudi princes, but my stockholder is turning 13 years old next month. You know, it's, it's a completely different mentality <laughs> when you look at oh, it. Oh, man. You know, so my stockholder right. cares about, you know, video games right now, not about return on investment. And I want him to have a better life than I had. If he wants to take over this company someday, great. You know, uh, if he doesn't, great. Um, I certainly, you know, never thought I'd be a plumber or air conditioning guy like my dad, but he was very successful in that job, you know, but he sent me on all the most terrible jobs as a kid. So I wouldn't follow down his path. And, you know, I don't know. I, I just think the mentality is do what you're good at, where you like the person you see every night at the end of the day and can live with yourself because, you can be a slave to people you don't like for too long. You know, I think that John was tired of his situation and that's why we partnered up in 2014. And I, I'm not sure how he believed, but we certainly, you know, when we partnered up business doubled as you'd expect, because there were two buyers, but once we doubled again, that meant we were really good at working together. It grew from the two of us and two, two uh, laptops to, you know, seven other staff and, uh, you know, the kind of volume that we're doing and all these venues and stuff. So, it's been hard. I mean, our, our team is a family. It's all been grown very slowly and we miss them. And we just had our zoom with all of them the other night. And, you know, thank goodness we're going to get to bring them back, even though there isn't a lot of work. You know, I think that's the best part of, you know, come back around to save our stages. We can bring them back on and we can figure out how to be even better with all of the downtime that we have here. Yeah. And how is Save Our Stages? How does that work from your perspective, both from, um, uh, you know, owning a state, owning stages, being a promoter? When are those checks coming in and how do you how do you know what size the checks are well, and what are they asking of you to prove? And how does that unlike, how does that whole system work? From well, your like, unlike most I don't want to speak for others, but I've been very carefully reading the bill as it's changed. I think it's for mm -hmm. us is that. Um, granted from March 10th on or March, the end of March on, it was only, I think maybe it was early April, but whatever it was, it was only John and I on the payroll for this year. Um, and, but what save our stages says is that it will cover, it will reimburse us for our salary and expenses of 2020 and the same for all of, from March 10th on and the same for all of 2021. So that gives us incentive to bring all of our people back as soon as possible. So, Brad, so when you say reimburse, you mean what your prior, we, whatever you right. laid some people, you laid a lot of people off, but what, whatever you were paying before that. Correct. Prior. So let's, 
the way I read it is that John's in my payroll from 2020, all of our staff in mm -hmm. 2021, uh, and mm -hmm. all of the uh, utility expenses, rents and utilities that you have. So internet, phones, that kind of So basically what it does, there's no profit here. This is getting DSP back to whole. I mean, look, you're a company with nine people. You can't shut off the $600 a month copier lease or this, the office lease or the you know telephone system or the internet relationships. Like you have to, we had to have a website up. We had to communicate. So when you add all that stuff up, it's a tremendous amount of money. And I think, you know, if this truly comes through as a grant uh, for the amount that I think it was, we'll, we'll be able to, when we get to, back to business, we'll be at, it's almost like the, the spot where we ended. Now, granted, there's a ton of losses and shows that didn't play and shows that went away and expenses you'll never get back in advertising and lost. Lost. I mean, like, how, how do you how do you look at a venue that's, you know, charging you rent and you send a deposit and they're struggling to stay alive and you cancel the show and the contract says when you cancel the show, they keep the deposit, even in extraneous circumstances like COVID. Yeah. Bug me. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, what can I do? I'm not going to have them give me back the 300 bucks when we signed a contract. I wish they would because maybe they'll get that back. But what I'm saying is, boy, being close to whole would be pretty amazing because it's hard to have like five years of your life get flushed down the toilet by something you had nothing to do with. If I made bad calls and our shows lost money, I got to. Right. And I'm and it's your, pro it's your problem. Yeah. As we've grown, when I make a mistake, I make a big mistake. I mean, a couple of years ago, we had a we did Old Crow Medicine Show at Oma Gang every summer. And, you know, Bobby Cutt and I decided to raise the ticket price 10 bucks. And when I sent the email to my staff to put the show on sale, I never put that $10 increase in there. You know when I found out I was $10 short on every ticket? The day before the show when I drove to Oma Gang and we'd sold 3,000 tickets. So you do that. That yeah. was a $30,000 hit that I learned about with no way to fix it, you know? Right. So, Wow. Well, that's how you know about the like the flexibility of the market. Right. I survived my last panic time. attack that night when it happened. But <laughs> I mean, it happens. And when you make a mistake like that, luckily, we've been successful and done enough volume that it sucked. And I, the band knew something was wrong and they asked me about it and they took a little less, which was really kind of. Oh, we, OK. I there didn't you know. ask them to. I've never asked for, you know, I've, I might have asked for a reduction once or twice in my life. And it's only because it's been a really, really big, devastating hit. That well, dude, you must have massive good karma out there. So, you know, <laughs> what goes around I comes around so. sometimes, right? I hope so. Yeah. And I don't know. I've always tried to be a little more respectful and humble than the next guy, if it's at all possible, you know, but. Yeah, no, I think you've done a good job with that from what I know. So, so you talked about, let's, um, uh, I just wanted to circle back one more time. Uh, you talked about Avets in the Rain, the National at the State Theater with a hundred people. What's one other? What's a couple other shows that come to mind? Just being some awesome shows that you've seen. Well, I mean that. I mean, you've got such a huge <laughs> number of shows so to many. choose from. I, mean, I was own talking about the great part of some Lay something on me. Amazing stuff. I mean, the first real show I did at Cornell was a was a blues traveler. Uh, Segway show with spin doctors at Bailey Hall. I didn't know what I was doing and sold 1500 tickets to a show. Oh, yeah, wait, yeah, tell me about that. That was when each one they successively came on the stage and took another yeah, instrument, oh, and then or you knew it that. one with the other, and it was just this constant jam and 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 like flat 750 with spin doctors. And when it was all over, I had like five grand left over, I didn't even know what to do with it. I'm like, I made more than the band, what do you do here? We gave it to a land trust and and you know, because it was done under the auspices of a fraternity and a not-for-profit. So can you explain what they did at that show and how did that come? Well, about? it started like Spin Doctors went on as the opener. And then as 45 minutes set ended, like Bobby Sheehan would walk out and start playing bass also. And then before you knew it, Mark White was off the stage. And then, you know, uh, the second song and jam and there was more people on next thing you know it was a blues traveler song and it was all of them on stage and if you weren't paying attention you didn't even see it happen and then I went back to to spin doctors for a second set it was pretty awesome those were good days i mean i was around for that era of the jam bands happening when, when fish first played the state theater or excuse me when fish first played the haunt when i was in college three people came Literally, I, I found the poster. It's on my Instagram. It's like a unique dance band from Burlington, Vermont, you know, and the, I was lucky enough to be a part of the first four or five of the fish camping festivals from 
you know, Clifford Ball, Great Went, Lemon Wheel, you know, I, I, producing those as part of a small team when I worked for Great Northeast was just amazing. And it wasn't the bane of my existence wow. working there, but I would go up there for the couple of weeks that we built the venue and we just have lifelong yeah. relationships. I mean, just yesterday, I got 900 text emails and, and notes on Instagram because Trey posted the, the thing about the playing chess on New Year's Eve against fans, oh, which yeah. they did. And he's wearing a DSP Shows hoodie, which he happened to be wearing in the Sigma Oasis recording sessions. Like, we're friends. We've known each other forever. I gave him a hat. He wore it all over New York last year, and people were sending me pictures just yesterday thousands of stuff just be, and it was great it just feels really really that's awesome that's moment. awesome it's not yeah. they don't make me who i am but boy, i'm right it's a perk it's, it's a perk it's part of who you are it's part of what you're doing um i mean you were in college and you got into this right. and i mean you did what you believed in early on i mean i just i you're that's lucky and I admire it, but it takes a lot of perseverance as well. Well, I, I never did it on my own until 2008. You know, I worked for good people and I learned a lot from lots of great people. I learned from John Peterson at the Haunt and Dave Whirlin at Great Northeast and, you know, and, and Bill Graham and Dave Graham and Dave Fry and, and, and even Al mm -hmm. Perry who bought Bethel Woods, my, you know, where Woodstock happened. I've learned business from that guy, I learned from my dad running a company. So all of those pieces together yeah. at the right time, to put me in a position to start a company and me and a laptop in 2008 has become what we are now. Well, what I also love is that you learned how you didn't want to do it too, apparently. Right. Cause didn't you go down into the city, uh, into New York city at one point and work for some big ass company and you're like, fuck that this was, shit. Yeah, well, Perfect. it was a record company when I left, when I, so Bill died my senior year in college. So the job in California just went away with him and that was terrible, but it, it was. Yeah. So yeah. I stayed around for a year and because I'd met a lot of people at Columbia Records and Epic through Spin Doctors and a few other bands like that that I helped get, you know, signed or met people through, I took a job from Al, Al Smith, I think's wife or mother, I don't know if it was his sister. Oh, I know. She was some judge in New York and my aunt and her were best friends. Like, hey, you should go with the label for a very short period of time. And it was the era of shipping tons of records and bean counting 101. And it just didn't feel like it didn't feel right. And I took a break from it then and I moved to Boston and was booking bands for a while. So it's just like, yeah, I, I, everybody has to fail to, to before they succeed. I think it's like, you know, you can't win the Stanley cup till you lose it a couple of times, you know, in, in hockey. And I think it's the same way here. You got to go through it. John Peterson at the haunt. I will say this when I was first out of college, he let me book shows on my own with my own money where I'd have to drain the ATM of every dime I had to pay the band when I lost and live on a sack of potatoes for a week before he's like, okay, did you learn your lesson? Here's 500 bucks back. You know, this was 19 year old, 21 year old, whatever, Dan Smalls learning those lessons that yeah. you, you'll figure it out. And yeah, it hurt, but I'm who I am today because I went through all that stuff. So. Right. Yeah. Good people help you create the, the person you become, I think, you know? Yeah. And you had a lot of that essence in you already, but, you know, and stuck it out and just in a, this amazing, it's, it's about the creativity too, and the, the bands and, and the, the human factor and that you're bringing shows to people and that creating that magic as well. I mean, let's not forget about that. That's kind of, you know, there is a, there, there is a survival element. There is a, you're clearly an astute business person who also has a heart. Um, but, at, at the end of the day, you're bringing magic to people and you're making, you're allowing bands to bring that and get in front of their fans and making that magic happen for their fans. And the most important moment to me, I don't care the show. And I've said this a hundred times in a hundred interviews, but I will say it till the end of my days is that as many shows as I can be at the minute, the headline act walks on stage, I try to be in the wings just to watch it happen because whether there's 10 people or a hundred or 10,000, if I made money or lost, those people came to see this person who's an idol to them, who means something to them. And no one watches it but me in the way that I do, that I'm lucky enough to be the one that brings those people together in that moment. And there's nothing more special and there's nothing I've missed more this year than that. Watching Rhett Miller, the first national act on the first state theater benefit we booked, watching Rhett come on my TV in the living room playing a song is the closest I came to that feeling because I'm like, 
yes, I sent him a text and he sent me that song and I put a show on. But that's the feeling I miss the most watching, you know, it doesn't matter who it is and how many people are there. There's always that connection. And we're lucky enough to be the ones that pull it off. And, you know, it's a, it's a life in the shadows. And thank goodness, because I'm I've been preparing for this introverted time my whole life. <laughs> I work when I have to, but it's not who I am. I'm the middleman that puts it all together. And, you know, to be compared to Bill ever, which has happened a couple of times, is just mind blowing to me because I just feel like I'm some guy in upstate New York putting on some shows in a field, you know. That's good stuff, man. That's what it's all about, right? I'm going to come up to Oma Gang and then and uh, and see some of your shows up there. And uh, I'm putting Ith- I'm putting Ithaca in the calendar now. And some our point, goal. Man. I mean, Ithaca is a beautiful place. I mean, I I always knew I'd come back here someday, and I love living here. I mean, it's cheesy to say Ithaca is gorgeous, haha. You know, because it's got its gorgeous, but. <laughs> And you make all of that so much better for everybody in not only Ithaca, but all the surrounding areas, just because you put on great shows. Bring your bike. We'll go see them all. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Right on, man. (laughs) All right, Dan. Thanks so much for spending this time with me, man. This was uh, this was great. And I wish you the best of luck. Um, I know that this is going to this is going to turn out okay. I'm glad to hear that you sound like, um, you know, you're in a good position. And um, thanks for all the info. Thanks for what you do. It's great. It's great to be here. And and I always love talking about it because it reminds me and it refills the passion in me to to tell these old stories and remember how we got here. And it's been a hard year. I'm not going to be, I'm not, I'm not afraid to say that it's been a hard year and we're, we've made it through and we've got some months to go, but the future looks bright and we're ready for it. Yeah. Right on, man. Okay. Well, I wish you the best of luck, man. Thanks for being here on Roadcase, and uh, hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Take care. Bye. Okay, that was Dan Smalls. Thanks so much to him for being here. Um, you know, the common theme, of course, um, with promoters that are bringing bands to the people is that, you know, it begins with music, and that's where it began with Dan uh, at Cornell. You know, he had a love for music. Um, he learned that from his family, and um, he met the right people along the way. I mean, he crossed paths with Bill Graham, and that was amazing for Dan, and I loved hearing that story. Um, but Dan's got a commitment uh, to the community, to the central New York community. Um, he's got a commitment to music, and he's got a commitment to the live experience. Um He loves bands, and because he treats them well, because he creates this home away from home for these bands and these amazing venues, uh, they keep coming back. Um, And, uh, you know, he's known for his hospitality. He's known for treating bands really, really well. Um, And that's the kind of guy that Dan is, I get the feeling. I mean, he's, um, you know, relationships are are super important for him and that's what really makes it happen um in a community like that and it really speaks to his commitment uh to uh the central new york community and his commitment to bring music to everybody there so i loved hearing that and i loved hearing how uh his venues and uh, his business is doing as well as could be expected during this really difficult time. Um, you know, his uh, Dan treats his employees really well, uh, really concerned about how everyone's doing. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing how Dan comes out on the other side of this, uh, of this COVID period. Uh, it was interesting to hear how Dan's doing some streaming with Andrew Jensen and noon chorus who I had on the show. Um, Recently, and that was uh, interesting to get Dan's take on how streaming might play a part in shows going forward, even in a post-COVID environment. So it was really a pleasure to speak with Dan. I really enjoyed this interview. I want to thank everyone for joining me on Roadcase, and I want to thank Dan Smalls again for being with me on this episode of Roadcase. Thanks again so much for listening. And I'd like to encourage everyone to get involved with Roadcase. You can do so in a number of different ways. You can email me at info at roadcasepod.com with questions, comments, and even suggestions for guests. Or you can follow us on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're at Roadcase Pod. 
And we have a YouTube channel called Roadcase Podcast. And if you are able to and like to support Roadcase, we have a Patreon site at patreon.com slash roadcasepod. And of course, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite listening platform. And if you could please rate and review the podcast while you're there, that would be great. So I want to thank Waltzer for this awesome theme music that we have. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to Roadcase. We have a lot of great episodes coming up, so I'll see you on down the road. <laughs>